Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, Meredith. This is a, a new session of the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia colloquium. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Meredith Rolls. She will talk about the, the Vera Rubin Observatory, a big data machine for the 21st century. And uh, Dr. Isabel Marquez will introduce her properly. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever where, where you come from. Oh, that's good. This is what we have been as changes from this new period. And uh, thank you very much for being here to, to listen to Dr. Meredith Rolls talk today. Um, and and th thank you to, to Meredith Rolls for, for accepting our invitation. Of course, uh, we are very proud of having her here today. Uh, Meredith Rawls is a research uh, scientist and, and software developer in the Department of Astronomy at the University of Washington. Uh, she writes software to handle terabytes of nightly data from the Vera Rubin Observatory's Legacy Survey of Space and Time, LSST, which will ultimately become the highest resolution movie of the night sky ever made. Her background is in stellar astrophysics, but lately she studies the plethora of newly launched low Earth orbit satellites in the hopes observers worldwide don't lose the night sky. So that's the, something to acknowledge her. Uh, she did her MS at San Diego State University working on X-ray binaries to measure neutron star masses. Uh, and then she got her PhD at Me New Mexico State University in in 2016, where she used red giant binaries to calibrate the asteroseismic scaling relations. Uh, during this pre doc period, she received a number of fellowships and awards. Uh, she then joined the University of Washington as a postdoctoral fellow with the Robin LSST, becoming a direct fellow with the research institute formed within the Department of Astronomy of the University of Washington since uh, 2017. She was uh, promoted to research scientist in uh, 2019, and she spends about 80% of her time on software development for the Rubin LSST alert production pipeline using different imaging and 20% on, on science. She is uh, very active in science communication and is also engaged in uh, several activities to promote inclusive science. Today, as when I saw, uh, told us, uh, she will talk about Vera Rubin Observatory, a big data machine for the 21st century. So thanks again, Meredith, and, and welcome. Well, thank you very much for that thorough introduction. I, I really appreciate it. And it's, uh, it's too bad I can't be there in person, but this is the next best thing. And I sincerely appreciate the, uh, uh, the invitation. I, I forgot to tell her that I, I, I mean, we extend the invitation for a real one in the future. When, oh, that's very possible. kind of you. Yes, Reiner mentioned that as well. And I, I would love to take you up on that when it's, when it's possible. So thank you. Fine. Maybe we'll have a survey going by then. <laughs> close to <laughs> Hopefully. it. Hopefully. <laughs> so I don't have to introduce myself at all because you, you've heard all of that. So thank you again. Um, uh, I, I know that it's the tradition to have the question and answer at the end of the talk period, which is great. Uh, if something does come up in the middle, um, I have the chat kind of off in the side. So if you have something that didn't make sense, you're welcome to put it in there and I can maybe uh, address it in real time as well. So I'll start with kind of the big picture overview. Uh, you know, what is this whole Rubin Observatory LSST thing? Uh, if, if you've been paying attention, you may have noticed that our name changed about a year ago. Uh, we're still LSST, but we are now the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, operated at the Verici Rubin Observatory, which is, of course, in Chile and actively under construction. This photo here was taken, I believe, just last month, and it started to look like a telescope. Uh, like it has a dome with like actual stuff on it, and it's coming together, and it's very exciting. I have not had the privilege to go to the site in person myself, unfortunately, as a software person, they don't really see fit to put people on airplanes to go see construction sites, especially this year. Uh, but hopefully someday, um, once it's up and running, uh, we, we can have some kind of excuse to have a meeting there, because I would love to see it in person. So Rubin Observatory will conduct this 10-year survey. Uh, and as Isabel said, it will basically make the highest resolution movie ever made of the full southern sky. The idea is to have a uniform map of the southern sky about every three days you know, whatever the clouds and everything permit, obviously. 
Um, but the idea also is to provide data and software for the community as a whole. You, you cannot propose a specific observing target for Rubin Observatory, it's all survey. Um, but the science it will enable is, for it, if, you, if you like some kind of science in astrophysics, probably Rubin Observatory will do something very interesting for you. Everything from solar system to dark energy and all the scales in between. And I'll, um, I'll explain more about this, uh, the map of the survey um, on a future slide that's kind of an overview of how it really will survey the whole southern sky with a few, uh, few areas of deeper focus. Oh yes, and it starts in 2023, uh, the official 10 year survey. We, we were saying 2022 and then we had 2020. So we rebase lines and uh, we, we think we can realistically get it underway. Uh, it's a, it's a two and a half years now, time flies. I also want to start by acknowledging that, that people really are what make this observatory possible. Normally I like to have a conference photo, a recent conference photo, but this is the closest we can get. Um, this is a, a workshop I attended uh, a few months ago uh, to discuss the algorithms of, uh, that we're building as part of the software development team. And I wanna just emphasize that this presentation, much like the project is a collaborative effort. I have not done everything I'm gonna present personally. This is, this is very much um, collaborative. I'll, I'll mention names when I, when I think to, um, but uh, this is not all my work. This is a huge, huge project, huge effort, um, amazing, amazing scale uh, that we can all do together. So we did have a, a shutdown during the construction period um, due to COVID last year. Um, we are now in a phase where we are cautiously resuming work, um, but they did actually fully shut down the construction site and they turned off the power um, for a few months and it was very surreal because, you know, you expect this telescope to get built and then suddenly the world intervenes. Um, you can see here on the right though, there's a, a recent aerial photo from just this month, in fact. Uh, the dome is actually a complete structure, which is great because there were some delays in, in actually getting the dome fully assembled. Uh, so that is just wonderful to see the, the full building as a whole thing. Inside, there's also now the um, 8.4 meter primary mirror exists. It's that white thing uh, that, you know, obviously will be shiny at the right time. But for the moment, it's a big white thing. And the way it's designed, it actually has the, the tertiary mirror in the middle of it there, in that little circle in the middle. It's a very kind of compact telescope design so that it can slew efficiently. Um, and so the secondary is actually the picture of secondary mirror, again, with some like spiky thingies that will not stay there, um, is here. And then uh, it bounces back down into the middle of the primary and makes a full optical system that's quite short, but still gives you a really, really wide field of view. Um, so these pictures show some of the recent progress. Um, I will, they're lubricating some joints on the dome here, which is very important, make it spin. Uh, they're getting rid of one of the biggest cranes in Chile, I believe, in this, in this picture, because uh, they're done using it to work on the dome. Um, they're working on the mirror coating. This is uh, the actual the coating that will go on the mirror. Uh, this is the secondary mirror. And uh, this is actually a big chunk of the telescope mount assembly that was constructed in Spain. Um, but it has now made it all the way to the site. And it was quite the endeavor because to get everything up to the site in Chile, you have to go through this tunnel. Uh, and again, I haven't been there in person, but I've, I've seen some harrowing pictures where especially bringing the mirror up, it, it was kind of what set the size scale on the mirror because you cannot fit anything bigger through this tunnel on a truck. Um, so we couldn't have a 10 meter mirror, <laughs> we get an 8.4 meter mirror. And, uh, and the chunks of telescope mount assembly that actually go inside the dome to hold the whole thing together uh, were very interestingly shaped and had to be kind of tetris onto this truck in a similar fashion to fit through that tunnel. Uh, but everything made it in one piece and, and it, was, it was amazing to kind of witness that remotely. The camera is awesome. It is 3.2 gigapixels. Uh, it's, being, it's been built um, uh, at the Slack facility in California, largely, and uh, it actually exists now. So this picture here is showing one of the little uh, three by three CCD arrays we call rafts actually being assembled into the larger camera. Um, and there's a bunch of these all together that just make a giant field of view. So for reference, this is the full moon, half a degree. And the whole field of view is three and a half degrees every time it snaps a picture. Um, the little animation that just played, let's see if I play it again, shows how the filter changer will work. 
So it's it's kind of an interesting engineering problem to figure out how to quickly and like without being clunky, you know, slide a different filter in there because there are six different color filters. It's you grizzy. And uh, and we don't want to change filters, you know, every single exposure, but we want to do it several times a night. So getting that all engineered is really quite amazing. Uh, this picture here is one of the first pictures taken through the fully assembled camera. It took an old photo of Vera Rubin herself, who the telescope is named after, or the observatory is named after, um, and uh, somehow blew it up with some optical magic, I don't know, <laughs> and uh, and imaged the, the photograph uh, with the huge detector array. And they did like a, a Romanesco plant as well and some other fun ones too that you can, you can find online. Um, but the most important metric for the camera, in my opinion, is what a colleague of mine uh, showed a couple years ago at one of our meetings. And just to get the sheer size of it communicated to you, she computed that approximately 240 corgi puppies could fit inside the camera. Um, and But she emphasized that no puppies were harmed in the making of the slide. So it is large. <laughs> it is the size of a small bus or a large SUV, as we say uh, in the US, because everyone drives really big bus. So there's also a commissioning camera, which is now on site. This is kind of a mini version of the full camera. It's just one of those three by three rafts instead of a whole bajillion of them. And it is a real thing that takes pictures also, which is really cool. This is a, I guess this was the first picture that they, they took um, in Chile once the camera had gotten there. And it looks like it's just of some hallway of some dude. So, you know, nailed it, but hey, it works. And then they took an actual flat field image here on Sky uh, just very recently. So it's exciting to see that coming together. The idea behind the commissioning camera is that it, this is kind of the whole thing together in the lab before it went to Philly, is that it will use the full optical system of the LSST or of the Rubin Observatory, but it will be like a smaller number of pixels to deal with initially for us to like figure out what is happening. So we will get um, data that goes through the full optical path and we can use the same software that we're building and all of the other pieces, but the camera will just be kind of a smaller starter camera to get our feet on dress. So data from that will be kind of an exciting, it's getting real moment in a, in a year or two. There's also an auxiliary telescope. Uh, you can see from this picture, uh, this is from a little bit earlier when the dome was not yet completed on the main telescope, but there's a little dome on what they call Calibration Hill, which is not too far from the main, the main site. And it, job is to use spectra, um, slitless spectrograph, to uh, measure atmospheric transmission at the same time as the main survey is running. So this is actually a small, I forget the size, like a, a one or two meter telescope that was repurposed, so not that small, medium <laughs> telescope that was repurposed from Arizona, uh, donated and then relocated to Chile and uh, installed in its own little dome. And this is kind of a novel idea because uh, most telescopes don't have like a friend telescope to just to do better um, photometry, but we want to get the most precise photometry possible. And a, a good way to do that is to have another telescope that kind of follows along and uses standard stars or bright stars that are close to standard stars and, uh, and measures their spectra to get all of the details correct at the same time for calibration purposes. So it's exciting because it's back on sky as of like two days ago, I believe, and it works and taking some data and that's great because it was it had to shut down for quite some time because it was not a priority um, for COVID. All right, so that was kind of a fun photo tour. Uh, I, I enjoyed putting that together because I don't usually pay attention too much to the construction side of things. So I really appreciated the excuse to, to delve into that a little bit. Uh, in terms of the science LSST is going to do, it turns out it's tricky to make a survey strategy, even if you have 10 years to work with, that will do everyone's science optimally. Because you know, if some people are like, oh, I want to revisit the same part of the sky every day for like three years straight. And then some people are like, well, I really want everything uniform for like as long as possible. And then some folks are like, oh no, I just want to follow my favorite objects around. So it's it's tricky. Um, there are some core science goals that you can read all about at that link. Um, but and I think the next slide, I talk a little bit more about the specific science uh, drivers behind the project. Um, but the gist is that most of the time will be spent on what we call the wide, fast, deep survey, which is the 18,000 square degree, like main big green in this picture survey. That's like, you know, the uniform southern sky thing we talk about. Um, we'll get about 
825 visits per field over the full 10 years. So for any given chunk of sky, there's going to be 800 some odd visits of it. Uh, and the idea is also to do same night, same field pairs. So you go back and revisit the same uh, field the same night, which is really important for solar system discoveries. There are also going to be, um, uh, for smaller amounts of time, the survey will do uh, some deep drilling fields, which are shown here in yellow. And uh, I don't remember if those are finalized or not, but the idea is to hammer certain chunks of the sky a little more to get deeper and more time variable information. Um, not Nothing fast enough for astroseismology, of course, unfortunately, but still, you know, different different science you can you can get at with the with the revisiting it frequently there, and then of course drilling in on some areas of interest: the um, South Celestial Pole, the Galactic Plane, uh, the North Ecliptic Spur, getting a little bit of coverage um, in different areas as we're able to. And we have to do all this while accounting for the hardware realities, right? The telescope moves, the filters change. What order do you want to change filters in? There are six of them. Like that's a fun combination problem. Um, so maximizing the scientific return is tricky. Um, that being said, we're working on exactly how to do that right now. So if you have opinions about how LSSTs should do its observations over its 10 years, there is actually is a survey cadence optimization committee, which I'm not on, but I know people who are on it and they are seeking your input um, in the next couple months. Uh, and that's, that's open to anyone to tell us what you think is important. Uh, the, the four main science drivers, I will say, that ultimately got LSST like to be a thing in the first place uh, are dark energy and cosmology was like one of the main things when people sat down in the 90s and were like, hey, maybe we should have this giant telescope that just surveys everything, right? A lot of that is for weak lensing um, and cosmology studies, which is not my background, but is awesome. Uh, but then they were like, wait, if we do this, we can also measure a whole bunch of time domain things, right? Because we'll catch things changing brightness, we'll catch things moving uh, over a really long period of time. So the transient universe is going to be opened up in a way that it really hasn't before. And kind of connected to that, we'll be able to map a whole bunch of solar system objects, everything from near Earth asteroids to like weird um, interstellar objects to like interesting comets. Uh, again, as, as a stellar astronomer, all these things are my noise, but they're fascinating. And it turns out that if you tweak your ob observing cadence just a little bit, you can discover like a whole bunch more than you can if you do it a little bit in a different way. So this is what a lot of the discussions have been about. Um, and then of course, learning more about uh, our own Milky Way and local volume um, is a huge area of study uh, that LCC will also open up. So this, this figure here kind of shows the whole, uh, the whole 10 years we have to work with, you know, assuming some average cloud coverage and uh, the, the orange regions are when uh, they plan to have scheduled shutdowns because it is still a telescope, but there is still maintenance. So, you know, life happens, but the, um, you know, we got 10 years to work with, so we got to make the best of it. So now I will talk a little bit about the uh, data management system, which is actually what I work on. And this is kind of the software side of things. So it sounds great to have this amazing telescope that takes all these pictures, but then like, oh my goodness, you have terabytes of data every single night. What the heck are you going to do about that? So we divide our, uh, our data into kind of three different buckets. Um, there are the prompt data products and the data release data products. And then within the prompt data products, there's things that you're going to get every single night. And there's things you're going to get every day. And this is what we work on mostly at University of Washington. So every single night, we're actually going to have this alert stream that I like to think of like as Twitter, but that nobody would ever try to read all of, just like you would never try to read all of Twitter. Uh, you have to kind of pick and choose your areas of interest. And because uh, there's going to be something like 10 million alerts every single night, which just means a thing changed, a thing changed. Uh, we, and we notice these and we broadcast them. Uh, and there are going to be some community brokers, we call them, that are going to actually take the output of the alert stream that we're building and then and make that available to scientists. Um, so that, that's exciting, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. There's also what we're calling the prompt products database, which is what I build a prototype version of right now, uh, where the idea is that after we do difference imaging and find all these changing things, it needs to all go in some kind of database. And then you can query that database to 
make light curves or find strange sources that you want to study further. And then separate from the things that happen on a short time scale, we'll have these annual data releases. Um, and this is where you get the giant catalogs, the um, co-added images, the deep, deep stuff um, where you can go down to like, I think 27th magnitude over the whole 10 years in G filter. And, you know, you can find all your, all your favorite faint galaxies and, and things to study for, for weak lensing and statistical purposes. And down here is a bit about what we call the Rubin Science Platform. I'll talk about that more in a bit, but uh, just because the data exists doesn't mean you can download all of it is kind of the gist there. We don't want you to try to download all of it. So we're building tools to help you uh, use it. Excuse me. So I think I already said most of this actually, but the prompt data products are the things that happen on a nightly basis. The data release data products are things that happen on an annual basis. And then there are also user generated data products, which means that we are gonna build software so that users like you can do what you want to find other things that we didn't think of. Because uh, it's, it's, it's worth pointing out that Rubin Observatory and LSST have funding from the NSF, the National Science Foundation, and the Department of Energy in the US to build the telescope and to operate the telescope. But we don't explicitly have funding to do science with all of that. So my job as a person who is part of Urban Observatory is to make the data products and make them available and explain how to get them and what to, and you know and enable science. Um, but it's really the job of the of the larger community to take those data products and then do amazing science with them. So I mentioned alerts, and I mentioned there's going to be a lot of them. But what is actually in these things? So we have uh, when we find a thing that changes, we call it a source because hey, it changed the source. And then if we take a bunch of images and we say, hey, wait, things changed. And this is the same thing that changed here as here as here as here. We associate them together and we call that an object. So we will have both these different imaging sources and these different imaging objects in, uh, in the alert packets. So an alert packet will be for any one source. It'll be like, hey, this thing changed. Fun fact, um, here is the history of how it changed for the last 12 months, give or take. Uh, here is an image postage stamp explaining or showing like the actual source in the sky, um, both how it changed and what we're comparing it to to detect that change. And here are some basic um, metrics about it. What's the signal to noise ratio? Um, do we think it's a real source or just some garbage that we accidentally alerted on? Um, is, has it been wildly varying a whole bunch in the past or is this the first time it's changed? Do we think it's still a system object or do we think it's mostly holding still? Uh, and we also will provide, uh, in the postage image stamp, we'll provide the flux information as well as a variance error bar and a uh, mask frame. So, you know, all that pixels garbage because the detector is feeling bad today or whatever. Uh, so all of this information will be in these alert packets. Each one of these you know, nominal 10 million alert packets every night will have this information in it. So we're really thankful that there are these community alert brokers that are working to take this fire hose of alert information and make them digestible and filter them to find, you know, be it supernovae, be it moving solar system objects, whatever the case may be. Um, and they're, I don't even have time to go into them, but they're using machine learning and all kinds of novel approaches to uh, make simulated alert streams right now or, or work with other surveys that are doing similar things like the Zwicky Transit Facility to um, kind of practice getting ready for when the, the real fire hose turns on. So I'll take a minute now to talk about kind of what I work on. Uh, I've been giving more overview, uh, but this is a, a kind of a brief, a brief diversion of stuff I've been doing for Ruben. And so the team that I work with at University of Washington, we really focus a lot on this difference imaging and alert production thing. So it's, it's ultimately making those alert packets I was just describing, but there's a lot that has to go into, you know, image from telescope to like comprehensive alert package. It's not accidentally garbage. So you have to process the image, you know, do all your standard bias subtraction, flat fielding nonsense. You have to have a reference template image that is 
sadly not just handed to you on a platter, you have to build that from past observations and kind of decide what a reasonable approximation of the static sky is, which is its own whole hard problem that I could give a whole and we'll talk about. But let's say that you've figured out a decent way to make a, a reference image that is a representation of what the sky looks like when nothing changes. And then you subtract the two, which is also an algorithmic adventure. And then you find some things that have changed. And you say, hey, look, let's detect those. That part is pretty straightforward. We've, we're good at detection algorithms. Uh, so we find some detected things that have changed. And then we associate them with uh, things that we've observed in the past. So the easiest way to do this is to say location, right? OK, this star was varying last time I took a picture, and it's still varying here. So I'm going to add it to that object. And now there's one more data point for that light curve. Um, it gets more exciting when things are moving. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but this is kind of the basic flow chart that we've been pushing precursor data through, that I've been pushing precursor data through. And at the end of it, we wind up with, um, oh, okay, well, here, here's a precursor data set that I've been using. Uh, so this is kind of a cartoon of difference imaging. The idea is that, you know, you have your new image and then you subtract your template image and then, hey, look, there's something different and that will be what the alert would be issued from. And the data set that I'm using is from the Blanco uh, DCAM four meter telescope, also in Chile. It's actually just one mountain over from Ruben Observatory at Cerro Tololo. And uh, this was a, a survey just done for a couple weeks uh, in three different years uh, looking for supernovae. Uh, they didn't find very many, unfortunately, but it's still a really great data set because they revisited the same patch of sky um, like a dozen or so, more than a dozen times, uh, 20 some odd times each night. So uh, I picked somewhat arbitrarily three fields. Um, that were visited in both 2014 and 2015. And then what I do is I treat the 2014 visits, I use those to build up a template, you know, this theoretical perfect representation of the static unchanging sky. And then I take the 2015 images and I come at them one at a time and say, okay, let's pretend this is real life happening in normal speed. Here's the first image coming in. What did I find relative to the template? Here's the next one. Okay, what changed in there? And then at the end of that, you have like a simulated mini survey. Um, that you can use to, to test your software and your algorithms. So when I do that, I get a whole bunch of objects on the sky. So that's what I've shown here. This is not um, any, this is not actually plotting an image or a camera on purpose. This is literally just plotting where are the things that changed that I found by running the pipeline located. So if I go back real quick, you can be reminded that there's two little overlapping um, fields and there's one other field kind of off on its own. And that indeed matches up with two overlapping fields and another field on its own. Um, and so every dot here is a thing that changed. Now, I will tell you at the moment we're at something like four to one when it comes to uh, false positive bogus sources to like actual real changing object. Um, and we're working on trying to improve that, but actually for difference imaging, that's not bad, <laughs> it turns out. Um, but we do need to, we are still working on a, uh, a way to kind of put that in the alert, right? Because if we're sending out all these alerts, we would, you would like people to know if they're likely to be astrophysical real things or just like messed up subtractions. So that, that's, that's active development happening right now. Uh, this is a, a little plot that I, I make regularly that shows the, I think I mentioned before that every new thing that changes, we call it a source. And then we associate a bunch of sources together into an object to give it kind of a history. So for every object, um, there are a number of constituent sources. So if it only changed once, then it shows up here. And if it, if we found, if we caught it changing like 10 times in all of the visits that we had, it's here, et cetera. And what you see is that there's a big drop off here because this is, there's like 27 or 28 visits per field in the way this survey was run. So all of, many of these objects have uh, vary in every single visit which you know, suggests they might actually be real things that are actually varying. Um, and then there's a small tail here that corresponds to the overlap region in the sky where these two fields um, have the same spatial coverage. And there are some objects that are indeed varying for the entire, um, for the entire time in both. And, and the two different colors, um, I make some cuts on things that are pretty obviously bad. You know, you got to start with the super low hanging fruit garbage to throw out first. And so that includes things that are saturated in the center, things that are on the edge of the chip, um, 
uh, things that have what we call, we have this suspect flag that is very ambiguously named, uh, but usually it means you can throw it out because it's not a good pixel. And that's kind of what I'm showing here is this is a zoom in of some of, of like, maybe I think it was this section, I forget, or this section, one of these. And the blue dots are sources that do not have one of these bad flags. And the red ones are the sources that do have one or more of these, these flags that are pretty obviously egregiously bad. So the difference in these two distributions is one includes the red points and one does not. And so that's kind of the first pass cut you can make pretty easily. Um, but, but then it gets into the fun part of really figuring out, you know, drilling down and saying, okay, can we actually tell whether these sources are good or not? Um, and we need to do that on an automatic basis because I cannot, you know, as much as it would be fun to make these plots for every single image, like that's not happening. There's really too much data to do this many. So that's what I stare at a lot. And then on a good day, I, I make some light curves. So the idea here is, uh, you know, you have your 20 some odd or even 50 some odd visits and you can string those together to make something from like a light curve. So we, I looked at the actual catalog that came out of this data set the, from the HIT survey and they found some variable objects. Turns out that's what they were doing too. Uh, and there's a supernova there. It's, okay, there's one supernova at least in their field. That was what they were looking for. And then the, there are also a whole bunch of variable stars. And it's, it's worth noting that the variable stars um, sometimes you catch them when they're negative. So you look at the difference image and you see negative peaks which about as often as you see positive peaks because you are subtracting from an arbitrary template that you know is an average of a whole bunch of things over time. So that can get interesting to figure out you know, what difference flux really means if you're trying to do physics with the light curve. That's a whole other adventure. All right, so that was kind of the foray into the things that I work on. Now we'll talk briefly about uh, solar system processing, which is not what I do, but uh, a lot of this is from my colleague uh, Siegfried Egel. He uh, is also at University of Washington, although I think he got a position in Illinois, but he's deferring because COVID life, uh, and I think he got a faculty position there. Um, but he works on solar system processing and finding near Earth asteroids and understanding comets and mapping orbits and all this really cool stuff. Because, you know, naively in my own little world, I like to pretend that everything in the sky stays put, which I know is completely false. <laughs> but, you know, as a stars person, you know, the motion that I tend to see is, um, it tends to be more of the radial velocity, like, but the thing is staying put, uh, which is not the case here. So is, is the screen share working okay? Someone said it was shifted a little bit off. Is it looking okay? Can you still see enough of it? All right. So let unmute and tell me if I need to adjust something. So uh, the, I, this is kind of the big picture for the uh, the solar system processing. Uh, the stuff on the on the side here is what happens every night that I've kind of already described, right? It's the finding new weird things that have changed and making a database of those new weird things that have changed. But if you're a solar system object, you're not going to be spatially associated in the same location. It's going to be moving along. So it'll look like something that only has an object with one source and then a different object with one source and a different object with one source. But that's not actually what it is. It's actually like an asteroid or something. So we, there's a whole other process that has to happen. The, and the way this works is uh, some of it happens at the nightly level. So they will be able to uh, find moving objects that are both known and unknown. So like, you know, a comet with a known orbit and also like this unknown mystery new asteroid they just found from the alerts in the catalogs kind of as the alert stream happens, they'll be running on the output of that to find these new objects. And they will be creating a catalog on a daily basis for new objects that are discovered using these novel linking algorithms that again, my colleague Siegfried Egel and others are working on um, in active software development right now. Um, they can't quite run these like in the real time, um, every minute level cadence that we're aiming for for the alerts because it's a lot of processing, but they do think they can do it daily. So we'll be able to find new solar system objects um, roughly daily uh, with the, the use of these, these linking algorithms. And the idea here is that you have a whole bunch of detections, right? But then if you can make some clever assumptions about orbital mechanics, and brightness and whatever else again not not a solar system scientist it's, this is really amazing stuff then you can actually pick out that these six exposures were the same object even though naively from what i'm doing i would have assumed it was six objects like at different times 
Uh, so really, really cool stuff. And check out these resources if you want to learn more about this. We're also um, collaborating with the IAU's Minor Planet Center to actually uh, like catalog these new discoveries and then go back and refine their orbit so that we can do population studies and more controlled systematics um, at a more annual basis. So that'll be part of the, the data releases will be all of that uh, kind of bundled up together. So a real, real seriously big discovery engine for, um, for all of these new sources and objects. So just briefly, I talk a lot about the new and changing alert production things, because that's what I work on, and I think it's really cool. But uh, a big selling point of Rubin Observatory's LSST is also these annual data releases that will have these really deep stacked images. You can find the really faint stuff and do your weak lensing magic. Um, so that'll include several things. It'll include all of the source and object catalogs from the difference imaging that have been reprocessed again um just to make sure you know in case we were a little too quick and dirty with the original stuff it's going to go through all of it and say okay let's make sure that we've done that as best as we possibly can including a, a rough characterization of all of the objects and a uh, force photometry in all of the different images then we'll also have normal source and object catalogs not the difference imaging stuff that just you know actual normal images um that are built from both just individual images and also from co-adding them together into deep stacks. That'll also include forest photometry um, and drive parameters for those objects. So huge catalogs. And then um, finally, reprocessed images will also be available um, for both single visit template images and difference images. Uh, and altogether, there's going to be some 37 billion cataloged objects after 10 years, which is a lot. It's going to be like a 15 petabyte database. Uh, and there's going to be over 5 million of these 3.2 gigapixel images. And so altogether, it's going to be something like 100 petabytes is what we're talking about over the full life of the survey, which is, just doesn't even make sense to me. Like, that's too much. I, I don't know what to do with that. Um, but that's, that's why we're building software, so that I don't have to personally conceive of all of it. <laughs> um, it's, it's just pretty neat stuff. So, okay, this is the part where I want to briefly put on my other hat. Well, it's not really a different hat. It's, it's all the same hat. It's just maybe rotated a little bit uh, and talk a little bit about these low Earth orbit satellites. Um, you've probably heard of these, right? Uh, SpaceX Starlink is kind of the one that gets in the news most often. And they're just launching a bajillion of these things. Uh, and they're brighter than we expected. And some they're most prevalent near twilight, but some of them are visible uh, and illuminated by the sun all night long, um, especially when the, the nights are shorter in summertime. So there have been a couple of, uh, there's been a lot of effort uh, between astronomers uh, coordinating with some of the satellite companies to come up with some key recommendations that we're trying to disseminate as much as possible to both the satellite operators and to the astronomers to try to mitigate this problem because the sheer number of these things is staggering. It's been not quite the 100 petabyte, you know, database level staggering, but, but they are, we are currently on a path where they will probably be something of order 100,000 um, low Earth orbit satellites in the next decade. And in contrast, we only have like a couple thousand now. So this is like an order of magnitude sea change that's currently happening at a really fast industry tech pace where they're like, hey, let's launch a bunch of satellites to do arguably some good things. I'm not, you know, anti-progress or anti-satellite, but I am pro our guys that are good for science. <laughs> so it's tricky. Um, and, it, and a lot of the issues are subtle. So what, one of the issues, if you want to read more about this, I, I highly encourage you to look at the paper I was a co-author on in 2020, uh, led by Tony Tyson at all. That's specifically about the impact of satellites on Rubin Observatory. We go into lots of detail about um, nonlinear crosstalk is one particular concern that the weak lensing folks have. Um, because if you're subtracting little stripes here and there willy nilly all across, then you mess up your error bars basically when you try to do any kind of large scale statistics um, on brightness variations in a large scale. So it's, it's not usually a detector saturation problem, um, but you get lots of just pernicious little things that can that can potentially mess this up. And what, what really is is personally annoying about this to me is that nobody has a clear pathway for how we're going to fund the crucial mitigation work here. It's kind of a new problem that's sprung up in the last year or two. 
and the satellite companies are willing to have meetings with us and they're willing to change their designs to some degree, which is wonderful, but they're not willing to say, here's a bunch of money to build another telescope because we're going to, you know, make this survey effectively shorter by like having a bunch of bright streaks in your data. So it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing situation. Um, this is a video I, that I think we'll play. This shows uh, the current population of satellites visible from the Rubin Observatory site over the course of a night. They chose July, which is a southern winter. Um, so as you can see, as we get towards the middle of the night, there's not too many of these suckers flying around, um, but there's still some. And then uh, it'll eventually start being sunrise, close to sunrise, and you'll get a bunch more coming back. Um, these figures on the right are from the Tyson paper that I'm a co-author on that I'd encourage you to read um, that to learn more about the specifics, but we can't dodge these smaller narrow field telescopes like doing individual targets like have an opportunity potentially to dodge or reobserve or you know plan around satellites, but something the scale of Rubin. Um, it, it's literally the same thing that makes it good for discovering new unknown things that also makes it particularly vulnerable to large numbers of bright satellites. Um, so this is kind of what keeps me up at night, so to speak. Uh, the good news is that we do have um, algorithms that we've developed to kind of deal with the satellites in our deep stacked images. Um, you know, error bar, variance plane concerns notwithstanding, we can make it go from there's a streak in this stack to there's no streak in this stack. So, you know, that's totally doable. Um, but you know we're trying to do a little more than just make pretty pictures here trying to learn about the universe and find new things we didn't even expect so uh at the moment even the best mitigated satellites are brighter than we'd like um the spacex starlink has the most of these up so they're mostly what we've studied so far and we find that the even their darkest ones that they've been working to darken are about sixth magnitude um whereas undarkened ones are about fifth magnitude and this is a stationary air mass corrected magnitude as if they were at Zenith. Uh, I've learned a lot about moving objects in the last year. <laughs> they don't hold still those satellites, let me tell you. Um, uh, I encourage you to read more about this again. There's a report that came out last summer from SATCON 1 and a report from IAU convened at Dark and Quiet Skies for Science and Society conference and they just had their report come out um, earlier this month and I'm a co-author on both of those. Um, I just emphasize again that all of the satellite mitigations happening are currently voluntary. There's no regulation, which we're hoping will change um, as a result of the dark and quiet skies report, but it's slow. The pace at which the regulations happen is just so slow compared to the pace at which science happens, which still feels slow compared to the pace at which these satellites are going up into the sky. So it's just a mismatch of time scales. Uh, and I, I can't tell you how this is ultimately going to play out, uh, but it's something that I certainly am concerned about. So I know that um, we're running towards the end of this. So I have maybe five more minutes, something like that. Okay. Um, so, you know, I like the side. Ruben is forging ahead from the construction phase to the operations phase. Um, we are going to be getting the kind of full detailed plan for operations uh, finally getting written down this year. Uh, and let's see, right. So one thing that I wanted to make sure to mention is I, I, I apologize because I did not look up ahead of time whether your institution is a, any kind of international partner already officially with Ruben or not, because they don't tell me these things. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not on the, you know, okay. Uh, I'm not in the room for all of these uh, discussions, but there's currently a very much a work in progress um, model that we're working on right now. So the, the, what I can tell you is that all the US and Chilean astronomers automatically get full data rights. Um, and the international partners have the opportunity to join through what we're calling in-kind contributions. Uh, and so they just had a solicitation for proposals for what people would offer as an in-kind contribution. Uh, and now they're having a bunch of committee meetings and there will be a whole process to get this finalized. Um, there will be opportunities to get data rights via some kind of in-kind contribution if you or your collaborators are interested in doing so. If you already have um, collaborators in the US or Chile, you might not even need to. I'm not sure, don't quote me on that. Uh, but this is very much a work in progress. And if you wanna follow along, I'd encourage you to check out our community forum and look at the in-kind 
area. The idea is that you can't just throw money at us. We want something that's not a pile of money um, kind of as an exchange for, for data rights. But, um, oh, well, hmm. slides in a different order than I thought. <laughs> I was going to say that the alert stream and the software are fully open and public to everyone. So it's not, it's not like we're going to keep it all in a silo. I, I am super pro open data. Um, I'm happy to discuss that more later too. So what we do have that you um, may be interested to learn more about are these science collaborations. These are, uh, they're kind of, it took me a while to actually wrap my mind around what they are, but there are people who are interested in different areas of science. There's transients and variable stars, dark energy, science, galaxies, um, solar system stuff, uh, Milky Way structure, uh, AGN and other acronyms that I probably should have defined down below on this slide. <laughs> and all of these people are, are kind of, I was gonna say informal, but they're getting more formal collections of folks who have similar scientific interests and want to work together to figure out how to use Ruben LSST data to its full potential. And so they, um, they, they don't get money directly from us, but they work together to figure out how to use the science that we're gonna make. And they're working with precursor data sets right now. They're um, kind of helping us build software. I'm technically, I'm, I'm in the transient variable stars group because that's the science I like best. So I fill out a form and they said, sure, you're in our group now. There's a Slack channel and there's meetings. Uh, there's no membership fee to time commitment requirements, so you can you can join one of these uh, if you're interested uh, in that science without any kind of prerequisite. At the moment, again, because of this in-kind contribution thing, they have a provisional member or observer status that you officially would have if you wanted to join one of these right now. Um, I don't know exactly what that means, but if you want, if you're interested in joining one of these, I'm sure that I, I could connect you with the the right people to figure out uh, how to get involved. Because they're they're nice people and they're not going to be like oh you're from the wrong country you can't join our slack probably but. all right i mentioned this before too but we don't want people to try to download all the images we're building a whole suite of software tools to interact with them and then what i want to highlight is called the rubin science platform this is what i use pretty much every day for my work and it's what um, folks will use in the future to access uh real data from rubin observatory so it's basically a Jupyter lab, uh, which is like a Jupyter notebook, but shiny, and that you don't have to run on your own computer. So you go to a website and it has all of the software Python stuff already set up and ready to rock. You don't have to install and yell at Conda and you know swear at pip and whatever else you do to get stuff up and running. And then you can just import LST dot whatever and just make plots and it's great. So that's kind of the future of how it's already kind of expectation in some spheres. Um, but it's, it's the future of how this is going to work is we don't want you to download all of the data, we want you to bring your code, and then mesh it in with our code, and then use the science platform. So that's very exciting. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, all of the different pieces of this, we actually recently made a series of short YouTube videos um, on our YouTube page that introduce everything from like the science drivers to, um, to the, how the science platform I was just describing works. Um, you know, if there's any section of this talk that you were zoning out during, probably these little one minute videos will get you up to speed. Um, there is also a subset of data that's gonna be public via the education public outreach team. Um, some of that is for citizen science projects. Some of that's like for K through 12 classrooms. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities here. There's also, I want to highlight, there's this um, DSFP, Data Science Fellowship Program, that we run uh, through the LSST Corporation funds this. And that means there's no international restrictions whatsoever because they are great. And they have, this is for, I believe, mostly graduate students who are interested in learning a little bit more about data science and how to apply it to Ruben Observatory in the future, kind of as like a career launching thing. Um, their website is not updated right now, but I hear directly from one of the main people running it that they will be doing a solicitation for students to apply this spring to summer. Um, so keep an eye out for random emails that have that acronym in it, <laughs> LSSDC, DSFP, and you, uh, and I would highly encourage you to consider having your students apply for that um, because it's a, a superb program. It's virtual right now because it, everything is virtual.
Right, and so as I, I have just like two slides up, I believe. Um, I just want to kind of wind down by emphasizing that the software is at least as important as the science. And I'm biased because I work on the software, but like it's really is a main thing that we are building kind of alongside the physical hard telescope. We are building this, this software pipelines that can handle this amount of data in a consistent way. Um, it's mostly Python. Uh, there's some C++ kind of under the hood that I try not to touch more than I have to. Uh, and it does everything from process images, um, help serve them, you know, catalogs, generating alerts, all of it. It's all open. Uh, if you like GitHub, you can spend way too long looking at all of the strange commit simple requests that we have. There's also friendly documentation and a tutorial if you want to just look at a small subset of data and get a handle on how our tools work. I will say we're switching from using a, what we call a generation two middleware to a generation three middleware. And I don't know if our tutorial has caught up to the latest and greatest yet. So don't spend too much time going down that rabbit hole. Um, but feel free to reach out to me about something you're interested in learning more about. Um, there's also an informal stack club that meet uh, every week and they do tutorials, notebooks, et cetera. And that doesn't have any international restrictions either, I don't believe. Um, so if this is something that you're really gung ho to get into, I would, I would definitely uh, connect with the stack club folks. And we have a very friendly forum where people can ask questions that they think are silly, but that are actually good. All right, um, there's a data preview coming soon that is gonna be fake data, but we're gonna pretend that it's real and we're gonna have it on the science platform and up to 300 folks can apply to play with it. Uh, this is a data rights limited thing. You have to have the data rights to apply to be one of the cool kids for this preview program, but I'm excited because it means we have to scale up from like the, you know, dozen to hundred people who occasionally use it at once to like, oh, there's 300 users all of a sudden. Maybe we should make sure things aren't broken. So that's good. Um, this is my last slide. I, I'll just close by summarizing uh, that Ruben LSST is a huge collaborative effort. I have presented a whole bunch of things here today uh, and it's not all me, it's, it's a team and it's awesome. Uh, it's gonna start in 2023, gonna do all the science with all the data Possibly with some satellites in the mix, just to confuse everybody. Um, the uh, the science platform will let you bring your analysis code to our data, uh, and it's going to be a really awesome future with petabytes of astronomy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. Very nice and interesting talk, and we have a lot of links uh, to read and follow here. So. Now the talk is open for questions. For doing that, please raise your hand, press the reaction button in the bottom menu here, and you will raise your hand, and I will give you the ability to talk. Um, okay. We have uh, one question here, Maria Caballero Garcia, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the talk, it's very interesting. I got two questions. The first is that if there will be spectroscopic capabilities in this in this observatory, and the second one is since uh, Spain has provided the, the 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 primary mirror, if there will be any I don't know benefits or or whatever different to the rest of the international collaboration to Spain. I I don't know. Well, they're both excellent questions. Thank you. Um, for, in terms of spectroscopy, we do not have a dedicated um, simultaneous spectroscopy on site. The only thing we have is the um, auxiliary telescope, and that's just for your photometric calibrations. It's not actually for getting follow-up spectra of your favorite objects. We do have um, some various level of formal uh, uh, working arrangements with a handful of other observatories that do have spectra. And I not heard much about that recently uh, in terms of the current status, um, but we don't have anything on, on site that that's up to other science um, facilities to contribute. In terms of Spain and contributing significant amounts of hardware, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I don't want to mis misspeak or misrepresent the situation, but I, I think that would be reasonable, but it's, it's not my call to make, I'm sorry. Oh. I can, sorry, I can comment on, on the Spanish contribution because I'm familiar with the oh, yeah. site 
so the Spanish contribution is that the Spain company, I think it's as to fair, built the, uh, not the primary, the primary is from the University of Arizona, built the uh, telescope mount assembly, the MA, okay. which was built in Spain. And plus, I think secondary is from France. So, and the, the optics is also side gen France. So that's the only contribution and it's pretty com commercial contribution. So there were no any talks on the data sharing regarding that because that's basically LSST contract, the Spanish company, which mm -hmm. wins the bid to build the TMA. Okay. <clears throat> that's my understanding of the situation. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's, I think they consider it pretty separate, um, like a construction hardware thing versus a, a data rights sharing thing. It's, it's all part of the same mm -hmm. larger project, but I think that that's correct. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Maria. We have another question. Rainer, please. Hi, Meredith. Thanks for giving us this talk. I, I really enjoy it. It's, it's, I learn everything, something new all the time when I hear about LSST. It's just such a huge project. I have a question about the LEO or uh, the satellites and LEOs. The, what's the, how, how much time do they stay in their LEOs? I mean, what's the remaining the half-life time of a LEO satellite? Yeah, it, it depends a lot on the company. Uh, generally, they have about a five-year uh, estimated lifespan. So there is a phase when they are going up into getting to their orbit where they are potentially brighter and not yet holding still in a consistent way. And then there's also a deorbit phase when they come back down um, mm -hmm. that we haven't had much opportunity to observe yet because it's still so new. Um, it, it's interesting because people will point out that oh, well, once they're at their operational orbit, they're not too bright. They're like at the sixthest magnitude, which is not awesome, but it's not horrible. But when they're, it's only when they're going up to the, their orbit that they are too bright and it's a problem. And while that's true, given the sheer amount that they want to have up in the sky, like at any given time, uh, there's going to be constant launches to keep to maintain that population and the new companies coming in. It's, it's a little bit of a Wild West kind of situation, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, and so the seventh magnitude that you say for the even the modified ones, that sunsets, or that's even when they're at midnight. Uh, well, it, it depends a little. So the 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 there's so many different pieces to go into it. Oh, no, just rough numbers. <laughs> but, I was amazed at how bright that is because it's it's hugely bright. I mean, seventh magnitude. That's yeah. well, they have big solar panels and uh, they're low, and so there, there's there's lots of things. We actually want them to be. Um, one of our rec key recommendations is for this, we prefer satellites to have lower orbits, which is seems counterintuitive. So you think a lower thing would be brighter, but lower is better because they spend less time um, going across your detector. They move, they whiz across because physics. And so they don't leave as bright of a peak in the trail. And they also are less in focus. So it's a slightly broader trail but it's like not as long and not as bright in the middle. So you don't get as many of the potential like crosstalk systematic stuff going on in that case. Um, but, and, and, and some of them also, they glint, right? Like they're not spheres, turns out they're like actual physical things. Uh -huh. uh, they're not black bodies, they're not spheres. It's very annoying. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sorry for this. If I can. Oh no, I, I, I very likely will have a similar intrusion when this is done. <laughs> if I can also comment on this, you will not see the satellite in midnight because they are in, in earth shadow. The problem is also the, the problem is at the twilight period, at the evening and morning. And of course, if you put the satellite on the lower orbit, they spend more time in the in the earth shadow, so you will not see them throughout the night. Night. You basically don't care about the satellites if they don't shine. On the detector, right? Of it, right. The it's true that there there are some though that will be actually even be visible at midnight, um, depending on the orbit uh, that that's chosen. They, they've done a whole bunch of simulations, but you're right that the problem is worst at twilight. The, the most of them are there, which is interesting too, because twilight is the the time period when certain science only certain science can be done. So in particular, if you're looking for near Earth asteroids, that's a twilight search. So I think it would be, I really hope we don't see a headline of we missed the killer asteroid because of the satellite internet, like, <laughs> More questions, uh, Isabel, yes. Yeah, uh, I first like to 
too. Thank you very much, Mary. Isabel, Isabel, sorry. Can you put your micro? Excuse yeah. me. No. Thank you. I'm not used to having this uh, for the seminars because in the morning I have a different uh, different system. Sorry. So um, first of all, I wanted to to thank you, Meredith, for such a nice talk and complete and uh, complete full, full of, of information that we, we can check afterwards and with the links and so ever. So it's been great. And my, my question was uh, related to the um, possibility of having fellowships for students in, in spring and, and, and summer. So uh, is it uh, focused on grad students or is there any possibility of any of our pre-docs because we don't have an easy as access to grad students, but and, but we have a number of pre-docs here at the Institute. So could they be asking for such fellowships? I, I believe so. I'm not actually completely clear what you mean by pre-doc. I think the system is a little different in the US. Is that a, someone who has a, just a bachelor's degree or a master's? Uh, for I mean, uh, as far as I understand, uh, pre uh, gr grad students is just when when they, they are still studying at the university. Oh, I see. Sure. So like an undergraduate level. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that the um, summer program that I mentioned, the um, data science fellowship program, is open to advanced undergraduates. So if they're involved in your research, um, I would I think they can apply. Um, but when, when they put out the official solicitation for the next round, um, it'll it'll be clear. Okay, but yeah, they, so they grads, be pretty it, pretty open. Okay. So that that would be a, a great opportunity. Absolutely, yeah. And and just to I mean to insist uh, insist on the invitation of uh, having a, a a real a real visit here in Spain. So please take that into account for the future when it'll be yeah. possible. Thank you. If I may weigh in, I think graduate student corresponds to our pre docs. It's basically a student doing. Yeah, that. I've I've understood that. Yes, yes, that's, that's right. right. That's so not, that's great. That's what I was wondering. Okay, so mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely then. So I have a question. I'm working on solar system objects, and we are doing search for um, neos and main asteroids and trust Neptunian. So they have different velocity, movement velocity on the sky. Mm -hmm. And we had some experience and uh, in imagine the, the, the field of view every hour just to search for neos, and then every two or three days for uh, searching for TNOs. Right. And then the linking of this point, as you mentioned in one of your slides, is really difficult because uh, we identify the, the alert, we identify the change in the image, but the, the linking on is, this is the, the difficult part. So I think you mentioned two or three papers. Can you go back to that yeah, slide? Yeah, yeah, so this um this came from my colleague Siegfried Egel, who is here we go, who is working on this. So yeah, I would look for so, his HelioLink 3D, which I guess is an improvement on HelioLink. This is again, I have not read these papers. He but he's still working on this right now. The, these slides are straight. This these images are straight from the presentation he gave recently. Yeah, well, and um, another question is okay. I will I will read this and maybe they, they can solve the problem. Another question that when we image the same place of the sky with two, three days, five days difference in time, uh, we found that every source is really different. The, the scene change, the the altitude of observing change, but we have a lot of change. So when, when we make the difference imaging, we have a lot of uh, waste around the source yeah. and we can identify that with, with a, 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 another source. So how, how you, you manage with this kind of uh, spurious source? Yeah, the, the, so this kind of goes back to, I don't think I don't have a good picture here of the, you know, these different images that I showed are yeah. obviously yeah, really nice. nice looking ones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I have a different slide I didn't include that shows a whole bunch of bad ones. <laughs> but yeah, they often, you'll, you'll get mismatch in the seeing or um, like weird ringing artifacts if you right. overfit certain parameters. Um, that that's something that we're still working on. Right right now, we mostly use the um, Allard Lumpton algorithm for doing the difference imaging, but there also is another algorithm by Zakay and other people that we call Zogi because it's their last names. Why everything's a weird acronym, right? Uh, that is a different way to do the difference imaging that 
may get rid of some of the, um, particularly the, the PSF differences will be less pronounced if we switch over to that one. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have not investigated how that the choice of algorithm specifically affects solar system object recovery, although I bet someone has. Because yeah, we're, we're, we're aware of those issues. <laughs> it's tricky. So your, your field of view is uh, 30, 30 something CCDs, for example. So you, you can manage to uh, try to point the same CCD uh, at the same position of the sky just to avoid this. But when we have a large field of view, we have a lot of uh, curvature effects also. That, yeah, that sure. So we're really working. Yeah, so we, we are doing a lot of work in the calibration side of things to be able to correct all of that so that that again theoretically any CCD that you catch it on is correctable to any other CCD you caught it on so you at least won't have to worry about that. Um, all the other pieces, yes, you definitely have to worry about, but we're doing um, a lot of really clever um, calibration to make sure that the, the overall field is the same if it, you observe a thing here versus here, or at least correctable so that you can compare them. Okay, I will take a look on this work. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. More questions to Mary. I've just a comment for the audience in general. Okay. Um, I don't know whereas you have felt felt that, but we have been, we have had a an earthquake three point eight. I know. Yes, I have felt it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, me too. But I thought it was um, okay. That's good. I mean, well, your internet all stayed connected, so <laughs> yes. yeah. nothing here. Uh, don't like it. Okay, other questions to Mary? I'm really curious about the alert system. So, for example, I'm interested in. in solar system objects. So I go to this alert system and make my own filter saying which are the characteristics that I am trying to find in the alerts or... So you'll probably you want to, to take, um, to connect with one of what we call the community brokers. And I forget which one is focusing or which ones are focusing most on solar system objects. Um, but they are, are the, they are working to kind of take our fire hose, you know, pseudo Twitter stream of alerts and, and do clever work to filter it down to say, find your solar system objects um, and, you know, ignore the supernova and variable stars or what have you. Um, but, you know, again, depending on the time scale that you care about, right, if, you, if you're wanting to find the same day discoveries then you'll need to, to connect with the alerts or the brokers. Um, but if you're interested in more like population studies, then you might wait until there's a data release available after they've already coordinated all the new discoveries with the Minor Planet Center and gotten more robust orbits and other parameters um, so that you can kind of take those all together. It depends on like what level you wanna look at. Okay, also, uh, if uh, I, I'm interested in that kind of, uh, of that point in the, with certain right ascension and declination along two years. Can sure. I download only this part of the sky? Download the image of this part? I mean, like- I a... think so. Yeah, yeah. so um, that, that's exactly how the uh, prompt products database is designed to work for, um, so, so say you have like a favorite star or something, you, mm -hmm. can, you can go in there and find the, the, ob the difference imaging object that corresponds to that location. And then you can attach to it in the database are all of the sources that have ever been detected and even forced photometry on visits where it wasn't detected also. So, you know, if it didn't show up as a different source in some visit for whatever reason, you know, it was around the same level as the template or it was just having a quiescent period or whatever. Um, and you can get the full, the full history from querying that. And that, that's one of the daily level products that'll come out of the processing. Yeah, and, and again, it's it's more of a, it's it's ideally more of a query the database, and then if you need the image and really want to do your own photometry, like there are ways to get at it. But I, in principle, we will do the force photometry for you, and you can you can query for the object and then download the light curve. Cool. Okay. More questions. 
more questions? Okay, I think. Um, I have just a very, very small um, question, and, and it's not um, intended to produce any perturbations. Just is there any way of having all the links in a in some kind of a PDF file that you send us? Well, I, I can absolutely send the slides to you. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, thank you. Be, thank be you. Nice. Yeah. That'd be very useful. I would have sent them earlier, but I only finished them last night. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good just with the links. It could be fine. Absolutely. Yeah, I also sent um, someone from your journal club, the, the student journal club reached out to me and I sent them a few links to some papers as well. So. That's great. Thank you. Okay, if uh, there are no more questions, we can close the talk here. Sabel, you want to say some words for closing? Inviting her again. Uh, I, I say it again and again and again. Please come here to Granada and we will be delighted to have you here. So I extend the invitation of the, uh, this online web or, uh, or we webinar or whatever to, to a true one in which we can exchange, uh, uh, I mean, and, and discuss and have and discuss ideas in groups and whatever. It's much more lively. So I think it'll be fine to have you here. I would love to come. I, I've never been to Spain, so that it's definitely oh, on my list for many reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Meredith. And with this, I will stop recording now.